we are going to talk about average cost Markov decision problems. So, average cost MDP. Uh, the theory for, as you will see today, the theory for average cost MDP is far more complicated uh, in comparison to discounted cost MDP uh, and in comparison to shortest path MDP. So, so therefore, it will require quite a bit of uh, stuff that I'll prove in the class today or that I'll talk about in the class today, which will then lead to the optimality equation for average cost MDP and leading to a value iteration algorithm for average cost MDP, which whose per convergence proof, so the convergence proof for value iteration for average cost MDP will again require a little bit more thought and care than what was needed for stochastic shortest path or for average uh, for the discounted cost. Now, of course, uh, the reason why we are covering it, covering average cost MDP is because it's uh, one of the three different classes of MDP that people study. Uh, for most of the reinforcement learning, we will assume discounted cost MDP. So, um, so this is perhaps one of the few classes where you will encounter the entire theory of average cost MDP. Otherwise, we will stick to discounted cost because the theory works much easier, simpler for the discounted cost case. Okay. So, the assumption in average cost MDP is unichain. So, single recurrent class for all policies. So, no matter which policy you pick, the resulting Markov chain has a single recurrent class and possibly some transient states. And what else do we assume? Ah, so I'm going to assume that gamma which is 1 minus, should I use gamma? Yeah, I think I'm going to use gamma. No, we are using gamma for policy. No, we are not using gamma for policy. So let me use gamma min s a i u i prime u prime summation j in s min j given i u i prime u prime is less than 1. Okay, so I think uh, we are going to make these two assumptions. Okay. Uh, let me remind you what the uh, cost function is. So, this is x limit n goes to infinity expected O. Of course, I want C to be bounded. I don't want unbounded cost because it's a finite state uh, problem. So, limit n goes to infinity summation t equals 0 to n minus 1 divided by n uh, c of i t mu i t i t plus 1. So, this is my j mu and I want to minimize over all policy in Markov deterministic of J mu. This is what I want to get at. <clears throat> and I of course want to find policy mu star. And compute mu star. Yeah. What is the second 
So this is an assumption which will be required for value iteration to converge. So it's not required for the rest of the theory, but it is required for value iteration to converge. So this is basically saying uh, there is a state so that no matter which initial state and action you pick, uh, you get a positive probability of getting to that particular state. Uh, there's no easy way to explain it uh, as to why it is needed because it's just needed to make sure that the, there is some sort of contraction when you run value iteration algorithm. Is it for the contraction, is it a necessary condition or a sufficient condition? It's a sufficient condition, okay. yeah. <coughs> okay. Any other question? Now, of course, all of these sufficient conditions are, uh, so if you look at Putterman's book on Markov decision problems, so this is the book. Uh, uh, this was published in 2014. So if you look at this book, you will find uh, discussions in far more generality. So these are the, the simplest condition, and of course, the book considers cases that are multi-class, so they, they have multiple recurrent classes. And uh, instead of having this satisfied in one step, you could have J-step contraction. So, uh, so let's not get into the more difficult part of average cost MDP. Okay, this is this is difficult enough. Yeah. So with this theory that we're assuming a unit chain, if we have uh, two classes, yes, is, but want to treat it as as an average cost MDP, are we? Is it possible just to have uh, some epsilon transition probability to connect the? No, uh, no. Okay. So the multi class is treated completely separately from single class. And there is an easy way to adapt it down to. Yes. So once you understand the unichain part, then extending that knowledge to multi chain would be somewhat easier. But if I start with the multi chain, which is the most general form of MDP, uh, it'll be much more difficult to follow the discussion. Okay. Right. So I am worried about my student evaluation. So I have to make sure that I teach stuff that you can understand in the class. And uh, yeah. Okay, so let me start with some examples. So what kind of Markov chains would be unichain? So let's consider P to be a transition matrix. So this is, uh, this is I, this is J, uh, 0 0.2, 0, 0 0.8, 0, 0, 0.1, 0, 0, 0.8, 0, 0.2. So this is the matrix P i j mu i. So P mu, let me put the subscript mu in the expression for P. So um, <coughs> if you look at, if you're in state one, what's the probability that you will be in state two? Well, it's the 0 0.2. What's the probability that you will be in state two uh, it's zero, what's the probability that you will be in state three? That's 0 0.8. So you construct a matrix out of this uh, probability distribution function that's given to you, transition probability matrix that's given to you. Uh, so there's one thing we will notice in this transition function. So if you look at two, state number two, it goes to state number three with probability one. If I look at state number three, it goes to state number two and state number three with some positive probability, but it doesn't go to state one. Similarly, state two doesn't go to state one, right? But state one goes to state one and it goes to state three, okay? So these two states, they don't communicate with state one, but state one communicates with these states. So what will happen is if you run this Markov chain for long enough time, with some probability, like at, at time step k, with some probability it will enter these, uh, this state space and then it will remain within this state space. It will not go out of it. So this is the unichain condition. So for every policy mu, your p mu matrix should have this structure, so single class structure, yeah. So what is it uh, about uh, there being a <coughs> subset that makes the theory work instead of us being able to say 
that the recurrent chain is the entire state space. That's, uh, so this is a little more general. So you could have some transient states in this case. But if, if all states can communicate to all states, then that's uh, much more restrictive. Then you don't have any transient state in your Markov chain. But wouldn't that still satisfy the... Yes, it will satisfy the unichain condition, for okay. sure. Yeah. I just want to show that in this case, we have one transient state. And these are the recurrent states. Now let's... Uh, Let's take infinite p mu raised to infinity. This converges to 0, 4 over 9, 5 over 9, 0, 4 over 9, 5 over 9, 0, 4 over 9, 5 over 9. OK? And I can write it as in this particular form. This vector pi, pi mu, is the called the invariant distribution. of the Markov chain uh, under the policy P mu, uh, I mean under the transition matrix P mu. Okay, so this is a unichain, uh, this is a unichain matrix because it has a single recurrent class and you have one transient state. Let's consider a multi-chain setting. A any questions so far on this one? Pretty straightforward. Let's consider a multi-chain case. Zero point two, zero point five, zero point three, zero one zero, zero zero one. This is a multi-chain uh, distribution. If I take infinity, uh, p mu infinity, what I get is 0, 0 0.625, 0 0.375, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. <coughs> okay, so this is the, in this case, this is the transient state. This is recurrent class one, and this is recurrent state two. So I wanted to look at those matrices and tell me what happens to the transient state in the steady state. <coughs> Any thoughts? Basically, wherever you start, you end up in a recurrent class. So, so wherever you start, you end up in a recurrent class. Uh, so in the end, in the invariant distribution, uh, the probability measure that you are at a transient state is actually zero, okay? And you quickly converse to zero. Basically, very quickly, you go from the transient state, you go into the recurrent state, and then just stay in the recurrent state. This is very similar to the concept of stability that you might have studied in 3551 or any controls class where in the deterministic system you go to zero and then you just stay at zero, right? So that's the notion of stability. Um, and, and this is the Markov chain counterpart of it where you 
The stability means that you get into a recurrent set and then you just stay in that recurrent set. Okay. All right. So, <clears throat> so we are not going to consider this situation. We are going to consider the unichain condition. Now you can see that in the unichain condition, the uh, the final p mu infinity has a very nice structure where all the rows are the same. In the multi-class, multi-chain structure, the rows are quite different from each other. Okay, so that's why there is some amount of work that needs to be done if you are considering average cost MDP for the multi-chain case. Okay, so we are not going to discuss the multi-chain case at all. And this is the structure that is most useful, most beneficial to us. Now I have a question for you guys. What is one over n summation p mu raised to t? T goes from zero to n minus one. And I want to take the limit n goes to infinity. What is this equal to? So I'm taking the p mu raised to zero plus p mu raised to one plus p mu raised to two and so on all the way to n minus one and then divide it by n, take the average, and let the limit n go to infinity. What would that be equal to? Uh, it, I, I think it's going to wind up being p mu infinity, even though it's over a multiplication, and, mm -hmm. sorry, a sum and not multiplication, <coughs> because they're going to average out to the same state occupancies. Right. Uh, that's correct. So if you have a convergent sequence, let's consider not, not just a matrix, just a convergent sequence. If AK converges to A bar, then summation of AK over N, so K equals 0 to N minus 1, this would also converge to A bar. No, it doesn't go the other way around, so it goes one way. So if AK converges to A bar, then summation, the average of the sequence will also converge to the same limit, okay? So that's what is happening. P mu raised to T converges to P mu infinity. So therefore, the average will also converge to P mu infinity, okay? Has anyone seen this before? Yeah, this is a Cesaro sum. Um, but has anyone seen this before in any other class? No? Does it, does it, do you find it believable assertion, right? So the tail of the sequence is basically very close to A bar, so therefore the entire average is going to converge to A bar. And as Shipping rightly pointed out, this is known as Cesaro sum. And we are going to be using that in this particular lecture. Okay. Okay, so the concept of unichain and multi-chain is clear. We are considering the unichain condition. And I want all of you to remember this particular assertion. Okay, it's going to be important. Okay. The next result that I'm going to claim under these hypothesis, under these assumptions on the average cost MDP, uh, J mu i equals to J mu J for every mu. So no matter which policy mu I pick, the expected cost, the expected average cost is going to be the same for all states. How many of you find it believable? Why should this be true? Why should the expected average cost, no matter which policy mu I pick, okay, 
the expected average cost is going to be the same for all initial condition. Uh, I haven't introduced the notation. So let me do that. So that's my J mu. Why should yeah? Why should this be true? Because it's an infinite horizon problem. Right. So no matter what we're doing, based off how long we have to spend in the transient, mm -hmm. the infinite average that's from the transient will decay to zero. So we'll right. only get you know, what we expect from um, the recurrent n chain. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And since the uh, Markov chain is going to spend most of its time, not most of its, all of all, almost all of its time in the recurrent class. Uh, the costs are going to be the same. It's going to be the average of the cost accrued in the recurrent class. That's the idea. Uh, I think I need to cover the proof because I guess many other people may not have understood it. Uh, so the idea is, uh, since the Markov chain is going to spend time in recurrent class, uh, the total average cost is going to be the average cost of the recurrent class. But how do we prove it? So let's k i, so let's say 1 is in the recurrent class, so let k i mu be the time, the stopping time. when i t is equal to 1. Okay, so I start from state i and I hit at time k i mu, at that time I hit uh, the state 1. Okay, so I am in the state 1. <coughs> this is typically a random variable. I should perhaps write here k i mu okay but it's a finite random it's finite with uh, probability 1 because uh, it's a unichain matrix so therefore you will definitely hit 1 for sure at some point of time so k i mu is less than infinity almost almost surely Okay. Now I am going to write J mu of i is equal to limit n goes to infinity 1 over n summation t equals 0 to k i mu c i t mu i t i t plus 1 plus n minus 1 over n 1 over n minus 1 no is it n minus 1 or let's let me write it as 1 over n I'm going to change this oh n minus yeah I remember n minus k i mu over n into 1 over probably reduce minus 1 there okay
Any questions so far? Okay, so I'm just uh, rearranging terms. I've split the whole summation into the first ki mu summation and the rest of the ki mu summation. What is this expectation of this equal to as limit n goes to infinity? This is j mu 1 because i t uh, i of k i mu is equal to 1 and this is the average cost with the expectation this is the average cost of being of starting from state 1 since k i mu is finite and this n is going to infinity in the limit this is equal to 0 and this term is n minus finite number over n, n goes to infinity, converges to 1. <coughs> so no matter which state I start with, my cost is equal to j mu 1. Okay. So therefore, the cost of all the states are the same as the average cost of all the states is the same as the average cost of a single state in the recurrent class. So therefore, all the average costs are the same. So that's a, one of the main results in average cost. No matter which starting point you start with, your expected average cost is going to be the same. Now, of course, for some mu's, this average cost is high. For some mu's, it is low. We want to find the mu for which the average cost is the minimum. Okay, so that's our eventual goal. Any question on this claim? Yes. So is it possible that the limit doesn't exist because when we define the average cost, we define the limit too? Right. So, but in this case, my c is finite. My C is finite and I'm assuming the unichain condition, so the limit will always exist, okay? So you have issues with the limit when you are in the infinite state space setting, so, um, so but we are not in that particular setting, okay? So, okay, now let's consider J mu as a matrix sum, so this can be written as limit n goes to infinity 1 over n summation t equals 0 to n minus 1 p mu raised to t c mu. Okay, so c mu is the cost vector under the policy mu, p mu raised to t is the uh, transition probability uh, when you are using the policy mu. Okay. So there is no expectation here because the expectation is implicit in this transition probability. So these two these two expressions are exactly the same, no difference. And this J mu is a vector, C mu is a vector in RS. So J mu and C mu are vectors in RS. Okay, P mu is a transition probability. Okay, C mu does not depend on time t, okay? So the only thing that depends on time t is this P mu going, P mu raised to t. So actually I can take this out and C mu becomes a standalone vector that gets multiplied to this average of matrices. What did we see a few minutes ago? Well, actually this uh, average converges to some matrix P star. Okay, remember P star had that structure, P star was 1, 1, 1 multiplied by pi mu. Oh, I need to put mu everywhere. Please remind me to put mu everywhere because everything depends on mu, okay. All right, so J mu 
is equal to p mu star c mu. Okay. <clears throat> What's the property of this p mu star? I want to be able to write the pro yeah. So we have to say p mu star is the same as p mu infinity. Yes, it is. Okay. Yeah, because of the unichain condition. Okay. So p mu star multiplied by p mu so this is the first property and the second property is p mu star raised to n is equal to p mu star. The third property, I minus P mu star multiplied by vectors of all 1 is equal to 0. Yes? So isn't that going to be our contraction argument? In this one? No, I mean no, this one? properties should be building our contraction argument that it's going to uh, We are not there yet at this point of time. Okay. okay? We first have to get to the optimality equation. Okay. So this seems to suggest, the third expression seems to suggest that I minus P mu star has a non-trivial null space. What does that imply? It's not invertible. Okay. I minus P mu star is not invertible because it has a non-trivial null space. So it has one eigenvalues that is equal to 0 because 1, 1, 1 is the corresponding eigenvector. Okay. Any questions so far? Now let's do the following. Yes. Yes, this is all the vector of one. Yeah. Does it have a fixed dimension? No, it doesn't have a fixed dimension. It should be of the same dimension as the number of states. Yeah. So this would be in R S, but it has all elements as one. Doesn't have a fixed dimension. Okay. Now let's look at the n stage cost. So n states total cost. So what do I use? J n mu. So that's the n stage cost. And this is given by p mu raised to t summation t equals to 0 to n minus 1 multiplied by c mu. Let's consider J star mu to be summation T equals 0 to N minus 1 P star raised to T C mu.
Okay. Can someone tell me what is this equal to? Let's think about it. So p star mu raised to t is the same as p mu star. And c mu is, of course, a constant vector. So I'm just adding n vector. So this is equal to n p mu star c mu. Okay. Let me call this vector g mu. It is known as the gain. Yes. Yeah. Oh. Uh, oh yeah, that's true. Uh, but it is with p star mu. So what should I do? Uh, let me let me use j bar n mu. Okay. So I guess star would also get confused with the optimal solution. So let's not use star. Let's use j bar. Okay. So what are these costs? So this is the cost of uh, the expected cost at the end of n time steps, if you were starting from a specific state, this is the expected cost that you would see if you are starting from the steady state of the Markov chain. Okay. So this is starting from steady state distribution. Uh, cost, total cost, starting from the steady state distribution. Let's consider j n mu minus j bar n mu, and this would be summation t equals 0 to n minus 1, p mu raised to t minus p star mu c mu okay <coughs> now This term, so I'm, I'm, so remember p mu raised to t is converging to p mu star as t goes to infinity because of the unichain assumption. So this term is going to zero as t goes to infinity. So therefore, th so now this is a sum, this is an infinite sum, so I'm going to take limit n goes to infinity eventually. But if you look at it closely, this is an, in, this, if I take the limit n goes to infinity, this is going to become an infinite sum for matrices that are going to zero as t goes to infinity. So it's not clear whether the limit exists or not as n goes to infinity, but I'm going to tell you uh, that after a lengthy proof, Putterman and other folks in their books have proved that this limit <coughs> exists and it is no it is uh, called hp so this limit n goes to infinity so n goes to infinity exists and it equals to hp which is given by a complicated looking expression i minus p mu plus p mu star inverse i minus P mu star. <clears throat> okay, this is after a lot of linear algebra. After a lot of 
linear algebra. Oh, uh, I should I should cite a source. So this is appendix A seven of Putterman twenty fourteen. No, A5. OK. So let me take the limit h is equal to hp c mu, so h mu. So remember I defined this gain thing here. So h mu will be the relative value function. So what is this relative value function? Yeah. Question first. Yeah. Paris, we were saying before uh, that, that, that I minus p mu star isn't guaranteed to be invertible. Is is the I minus p mu plus? P yes, this is guaranteed to be invertible. Okay. Yeah. So this is guaranteed to be invertible. In fact, this H p is a pseudo inverse of I minus p mu star. So let me write it as the fourth I minus p mu star pseudo inverse is equal to HP. How many of you have heard of the term pseudo inverse? Penrose pseudo inverse? Pseudo inverse? It, no? Is that the Penrose pseudo inverse? Yeah, the, it's okay. the same. Pseudo inverse, yeah, it's the same. Pseudo inverse, yeah. Okay, so this HP turns out to be the pseudo inverse of this matrix. Again, all of these assertions are very painful to prove. Uh, and it's it's really a long proof, so it cannot be covered in a single class. Okay, so what is the property of H mu? So if you look at this equation carefully, uh, for defining H mu, I am taking the limit n goes to infinity of this particular thing, right? Uh, and as you are taking n goes to infinity, uh, what you are getting is the differential cost of how much you would pay if you were starting from a specific state minus the, the cost of what you would pay if you were starting from the steady state. And this is the total cost. This is not an average cost. This is the total cost. Remember, the average cost is a constant. It's a constant vector. This is not the average cost. This is the total cost. And therefore, what I'm saying is that H mu denotes the differential cost when you're starting from a specific state minus the cost when you're starting from the steady state distribution of the Markov chain. Okay. So H i, H mu i minus H mu j is equal to limit n goes to infinity j n mu i minus j n mu j. And the reason for this is that j bar n mu is actually equal to n g mu. So because j bar n mu is equal to n g mu. <clears throat> okay, so there are two important things that we have learned so far. One is the terminology called gain, g mu, which is p mu star c mu. And the other is the relative value function, which is hp multiplied by c mu. So let me write it, collect that expression here. 
So, G mu equals to P mu star C mu and H mu equals to capital H Oh, HP also depends on mu. So, what should I do? Let me write it as HP mu. HP mu multiplied by C mu. Okay, now we have everything we need to talk about the optimality result. Any questions so far? Okay. Okay, so let me recap what we have done so far. No matter which policy you pick, because of the unichain condition, your expected average cost is going to be constant for all states, for all starting states. So we call that term G mu, which is the, called the gain of the average cost MDP. Okay, and the expression is given by P mu star multiplied by C mu. And then <clears throat> we also saw after doing some calculations that there is something called a relative value function h mu which is defined in this particular fashion and that tells you the differential cost between starting from one state versus starting from some other state okay so that's why it's called relative because the absolute values are not very important the relative values are what will what uh, makes it important okay <clears throat> Next comes the claim, let me call it theorem, I minus P mu G mu is equal to 0. C mu plus Pu mu H mu is equal to Is the first assertion obvious? And if so, why is it obvious? So let's look at one, two, three, four, five. How can I prove assertion number one? Yeah. Sorry, I lost you. Can you say that again? Uh, G mu is equal to P mu star C mu, and P mu times P mu star equals to P mu star first one. Oh, yeah. OK, so that's, that's right. So there are many ways you can prove this. So the first way to prove it is, or the obvious way to prove it is, I know that G mu is a constant vector, right? That's what we proved. So if G mu is a constant vector, and 1 is in the null space of I minus P mu star, then definitely I minus P mu multiplied by G mu is going to be zero because G mu is also in the null space of I minus P mu. Okay, so, so that's one way to prove it, but let me write what he has said, which is much easier to see. So I minus P mu, P mu star G mu, no, C mu is equal to Thank <laughs> you. 
excuse me. Okay, so the first assertion is obvious. Okay. Uh, for the second assertion, I need to write a property of HP. So let let me write it here. So HP mu oh. sixth assertion I minus P mu H P mu is equal to I minus P mu star. Okay, so that's the sixth point, and I'm going to use that here. So, so I have C mu plus P mu H mu so c mu plus p mu h p mu c mu what is this equal to Okay, so sixth <coughs> expression implies this uh, equality. I'm going to use that here. So I plus P mu H P mu is equal to, so from sixth above, it's this is the same as H mu plus G mu. Yes. What's the significance of theorem item two, or is it just something we need for the future proofs? Uh, sorry, what was the question? The, the for the theorem, uh -huh. um, item one uh, makes sense as as a useful po possible property. Right. But theorem two either must have some intuition behind it, or is required for a later argument in a future. It's required. Proof. Okay. So look at. I want you to look at this particular expression. What does this correspond to? That was my next question. So if you go back through your notes and look at the operators, the definition of operators we defined for uh, value iteration, what does this operator correspond to? So this operator is acting on H mu. What is this operator? It's, it's there in your notes. So. <laughs> If you look at the word, you won't see the operator. Step just the next step in the iteration. 
So that's uh, the operator T mu. Okay, so T mu of H mu is actually Does everyone recall this operator? Okay, so in the case of T, operator T, the value iteration operator, we had min over all possible mu. In this case, of course, we don't have min over all possible mu. T is parameterized by mu. And it's just an affine expression in H mu. So in the case of uh, discounted cost, you had an alpha here. In the case of total cost and in the case of average cost, there is no alpha here. So, or, or rather, alpha is equal to 1. Okay. Yeah. Um, previously, the T operator was over V, was it not? Yes, yeah, so, so H mu is, is a function from S to R. So this is in R raised to S, okay. which is also the value function space. But this is not the value function. So that's why I, it has a different, it's a relative value function, not a value function. Okay. Remember, I had mention it in the mm -hmm. board, so I raised it. It's a relative value function, not a value function. Okay, so what we have shown is, in this particular theorem, that T mu H mu is actually equal to H mu plus G mu. Now what do we do in value iteration? Well. We take minimum over all possible mu, right? So that's the idea of using value iteration. So that leads us to the optimality equation for average cost MDP, where G star, H star optimal if and only if min over u of I have to write it carefully. So min over u of summation p i j u this summation is over j multiplied by c i u j plus H, H star J is equal to H star I plus G, G star. So remember G star here is, a, let me write it as G star I, but remember that G star is a constant vector. So it's not really, uh, it doesn't really depend on I, it's a constant. Let me just write it does not depend on I. <clears throat> and this is my operator T of H, H star. T of H star I. Okay? So we had to do all this work in order to get to this particular expression. So yeah. T is a linear operator here? T mu is a linear operator, not T. T is a Bellman operator which comes with min over u. So here there is no min. Yeah. So Previously, uh, whenever we were talking about uh, H, it was H with respect to mu. So were you saying the optimal policy for H, or is it? Yeah, so this would be H at mu star. Okay. This would be H at mu star. This would be G at mu star. And, uh, and mu star is the optimal policy. So the argument here would be the optimal policy. Okay. That is always the case with Bellman operator, right? So you define Bellman operator with min. Um, and the arc min would become the policy. So it's the same thing here as well. It's just that the 
Bellman operator has some very specific property where you apply the Bellman operator to H star, you get H star as output, so it seems to, it seems to tell you that there is a fixed point, so H star is some sort of fixed point of the operator T, but then you get a constant number after that, okay? So we need to get rid of this constant when we are doing value iteration because otherwise, start from any H naught, keep applying the Bellman operator T again and again, like we did in the value iteration. You will keep accumulating G star and therefore, or not G star, but G, G1, G2, G3 and so on, and that will just blow up to infinity. But one thing we know from this expression is that G is a constant vector, right? So since G is a constant vector, I could do something important, which is change the norm of the space of value functions, okay? Does that make, does that make sense? So, H star appears to be a fixed point of the operator T, but there is this G star, which is a constant function creating a nonsense here. So we want to pick an appropriate norm on G, on, on the space of value functions H, so that I can get rid of this completely. So that's why there was this relative value iteration that we talked about in the previous class. So let's write that relative value iteration algorithm. So I'm going to talk about, uh, sorry, the, I have to talk about the norm. So now I'm going to put a semi-norm called the span semi-norm on R raised to S and it is defined by SP of V max over I VI minus min over J VJ. Okay, so I look at the maximum value of the vector and subtract from it the minimum value of the vector. Okay, so span of 3, 5, 100 is equal to 97. Because maximum is 100, minimum is 3. So this is 100 minus, let me write it, 100 minus 3 equals to 97. <coughs> Okay, so it's a semi-norm. So why is it a semi-norm? So let's look at it. SP of five, five, five. What is this equal to? Zero. So a semi-norm is not a norm, of course, but the only property of norm that it doesn't satisfy is the fact that a zero, ve a non-zero vector could have a zero span, okay? All right. Now let's look at this expression. Again, let's go back to this expression. <coughs> what happens if I add five, 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 or whatever, five, a vector of all fives to H star? Okay, so let's, let's think about it. Okay, all of you understand these two examples, so I'm going to erase it. I'm going to go back to the Bellman operator. Let's look at T of H plus K, H star plus KE. What is that equal to? Or in general, for any H, I, I well, no, not for any H. <coughs> okay, I, let me do it for any H. So T of H plus KE. So K is a constant. Uh, I have been using K. Have I been using K anywhere? 
No, so I can use k. So k is an r and e is a vector of all 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. <coughs> so this is one of your homework assignments. I think assignment number, question number 5 or something, where I show, I ask you to show that this is equal to t of h plus ke. Okay, and the reason is that a constant function here, a constant function does not participate in the minimization. So adding a constant function here, a function that doesn't depend on i, so that's ke, doesn't depend on j, so therefore you can pull that entire constant function out and that just gets added on this side. So in fact, the fixed point h star of t is not unique because if h star is a fixed point, then h star plus ke is also a fixed point. <coughs> Let me write that formally. So this property implies that if h star is a fixed point, so of course fixed point is in quotes because remember that there is a g star term also here. So h star is a fixed point of t, then h star plus ke is also a fixed point of t. This is of course the case for uh, the Bellman operator for average cost problem. Okay. Now we are ready to write the value iteration algorithm once we understand this. So any questions so far? Okay. So this is known as relative value iteration uh, start pick h naught arbitrarily <coughs> and define hk plus 1 <coughs> equals to t of hk minus t of hk at some reference state i, so i0. So let i0 be some reference state, so i0 could be equal to 1, could be equal to n, it doesn't matter because hk is a relative value function. and And once you have this uh, recursion, the theorem is uh, span of th1 minus th2 is less than or equal to gamma span of h1 minus h2. Okay, I want to give you a geometric intuition once you have noted this down. So because this is a span norm contraction, if you run the relative value iteration forever, this hk would converge to h star, the same h star that we have here. Okay, so we again see a 
contraction mapping theorem type argument here. Um, for those of you who are a bit mathematically sophisticated and might have taken functional analysis, I'll tell you how, just very briefly, I'll tell you how contraction mapping theorem can be applied here. So you have this seminorm defined on Rs. You can take the quotient space, which means you glue all the points that have the same semi, not semi norm, but you glue the points. Uh, so this is your point H. This is H plus KE, H minus KE. So you basically consider the quotient space where you glue all these, this entire line into a single point H and then you consider the operator T as a contraction operator with that, under that norm. So once you glue this entire space, this becomes from semi-norm, it becomes a norm and this becomes a contraction operator over that norm and that's how you get to apply Banach fixed point theorem or contraction mapping theorem for to conclude this result. So that's only for people who might have taken or might have studied quotient space somewhere. But I know most of you haven't. So I want to give you an intuition about what this relative value iteration does. Okay, so what we have shown in this result is that if H star is a fixed point, then any point on this line is also a fixed point. So this is H star plus KE. This is H star minus KE. So all of these are also fixed point of this operator T. So what you do is you compute T of HK and then subtract from it a constant function which respect to some reference state. So let's say you started with H0 here at this point and then you applied uh, T of H0 and it came to be this particular point, that's T of H0. You subtracted from it a constant function and therefore you arrived at H1. Okay, so this is subtracting this constant function from t of h0, then you compute t of h1, okay, and then you subtract a constant function in order to get to h2. Okay, and then again you compute t of h2 and then subtract to get H3 and so on and so forth, okay? So you are com you're always computing uh, the operator T and then subtracting something from that particular vector, subtracting only a constant vector, okay? So slowly and steadily, because of this contraction coefficient gamma, which we have assumed to be less than one, you are going to get closer and closer to this particular line, okay? And eventually, you will, you will get, so at k, as k goes to infinity, you will get to this particular point. Let me call this h infinity through this relative value iteration. But remember that if h star is optimal, then any point along this line is also optimal, right? Optimal relative value function, and therefore h infinity would be an optimal relative value function. Okay, so that's what this result says. So you're getting closer and closer to this line. So don't think of it as go getting closer and closer to a point. You're getting closer and closer to a line and then at some point of time, you just start being on the line itself. For the relative value iteration and expression, is I zero also something we can pick arbitrarily? Or yes, you can pick arbitrarily. You can pick arbitrarily, okay. yeah. So uh, I not arbitrary. Okay. Yes. So in this case, the H of K, H K of I naught converges to value, value function, right? 
Yes, so what will happen is hk of i0 will be equal to 0. But remember, it doesn't matter what the value at a specific point is. What matters is what the difference in cost is. Remember, we talked about the relative value function. Yes, yeah, so, so do we need the relative, relative value function or the value function itself? Uh, so remember, the value, the average value is, e is a constant number. So this is a constant number. And this is your g, g mu. So how we can get g mu from this algorithm? Ah, so that's easy. Once you get h star, plug it in here, you get h star i plus g star i. Right, so this g star is the gain. Remember, it does not depend on i. So this is, so how do you find the optimal policy? So well, you have found h star, which is optimal relative value. You plug in t, you plug in h star into this operator t, you get h star i plus g star i. So you can get g star by subtracting h star from t of h star. So let me just write it here. So g star would be t of h star minus h star. So that's number one. Number two, the argument of things within the operator T will give you mu star of I. So remember you have this min here. So if you take the argument, that will give you mu star of I. So that's how you compute the minimum of the average cost and mu star. So the minimum is g star. Uh, the minimum value is g star. The argument is mu star. And h star serves as a relative value function for this computation. OK? <coughs> Any other question? OK, there's another way to get this optimality expression. There are two ways to get this optimality expression. One is by converting the average cost problem into a stochastic shortest path problem. So that would be your assignment. The, uh, and the second way is to pick a discounted problem with alpha converging to 1. OK, so you, you solve a discounted problem and let alpha goes to 1. And that also, I mean, once you do the computation, you get the same expression as you get here. Now, the second op operator where you take, you compute an optimal policy or optimal value for alpha close to 1, and then you let alpha go to 1, that particular um, method of getting these expressions is far more powerful. Um, but it also requires a lot more work. And therefore, we have not done it in the class. We have not done the proof in the class. OK, so that is something. If you are interested in that, you should look for Blackwell optimal policies for average cost MDP. So it turns out that if you have a MDP and you pick alpha very close to a discounted MDP and you pick alpha very close to 1, the optimal policy would be the same as the optimal policy if you were solving the average cost problem under some conditions. Does it require the unit chain property? Sorry? Does it, does it need the unit chain condition? Ah, uh, no, so that particular method is true also for multi-class problems. So it doesn't require unichain. It's far more powerful. It doesn't require unichain assumption. Because remember, for discounted problem, we didn't make any assumption about unichain, multi-chain, and so on. So that class of, uh, uh, you get the same algorithm, <coughs> or rather the same set of equation. But uh, no, you get the same set of equations for the unichain case, but the overall framework can be applied to multi-chain setup also. OK? As I remember, there were conditions on the alpha to be less than one, strictly less than one. Yes, strictly less than one. 
Yeah. This will not, I mean, taking this alpha very close to one or converge to one, this will not, will not vary this condition. <coughs> Uh, sorry, I didn't get you. So you are saying if you take alpha goes to one. Will this vary the condition that alpha is greater than one? Oh, uh, so that's why I'm saying you pick alpha which is very close to one, but not equal to one, because if it is equal to one, then you can't solve the problem, yeah. right? Then you have to go through this approach. But if it is not equal to one, you can still solve the problem. And if you have an optimal policy that consistently comes up for alpha equals to 0 0.99, alpha equals 0 0.999, alpha equals 0 0.9999, then that is known as the Blackwell optimal policy. And that's also an optimal policy for the average cost problem. Okay, so that's another way to solve uh, average cost problem. And you can use it for multi-class problems as well. Yes? So if uh, the theory behind and um, the Blackwell optimal policies, because as we can use the discounted framework, yes. it's more powerful and it's easier to prove the discounted problems to begin with. Yes. What's the roadblock in the Blackwell policies to begin with that makes it so we don't just use the discounted yes. problems overall? Okay, yes. So for the average cost, Let's say you have optimal policies mu1 star, mu2 star. Mm -hmm. For the discounted cost, you will have optimal policies as mu1 star and mu3 star. So mu1 star is the common policy. That's the Blackwell optimal policy because it's an optimal policy both for the discounted problem as well as the average problem. But if you want to solve average problem and you instead solve the discounted problem and you pick the mu2 star as the optimal solution, then that's not optimal for the average cost problem. Okay? So... Did I confuse you? Okay. So discounted, let me, let me write it here and I'll be very quick. So for discounted, let's say alpha equals to 0 0.999. The optimal policies are mu1 star and mu2 star. For the average, which you computed using relative value iteration, you get optimal policies that are mu1 star and mu3 star, okay? So if you wanted to solve the average problem, and instead you said, let's pick a very high discount factor and solve the problem, and you computed mu2 star to be the optimal solution, and you thought that, well, that would be optimal even for average, that's not true, okay? So for average, only mu1 star is optimal, and this is the Blackwell optimal policy. Uh, mu1 star, not mu2 star, so this is not Blackwell optimal, and this is not Blackwell optimal, okay? So you have one policy, or you could have multiple, but you could have multiple Blackwell optimal policies, but, uh, um, but in order to compute them, you need to check for every value of alpha close to one, it should appear as one of the optimal solutions. So, but, but the reason why I'm con con when I'm talking about it is, if for discount factor 0 0.999, you had only one optimal solution, and the same optimal solution appears for discount factor 0 0.99, 0 0.9999, 0 0.99999, then that means that is the optimal solution for the average cost problem also. But anyway, so that's all I have for today. In the next class, we are going to talk about policy iteration algorithms.